joining me are two women who probably won't agree with that much of what you've just heard from Mark and me. Gemma Tonini, columnist with the West Australian and communications consultant, and Fiona Scott, mm -hmm. former Liberal MP and government relations advisor. Give it to me between the eyes, Fiona Scott. Oh, look, Andrew, I don't necessarily totally, you know, disagree with with what you and Mark Latham were saying. I think there are elements whereby if you don't speak the common tongue, then it does make life a more a lot a lot more difficult. I mean, you see that with some uh, some communities that have come to Australia that particularly amongst women that may not have had the exposure to English, that they they then, you know, become very restricted with the opportunities that they have. And and I think that comes down to the type of settlement services we offer Australians when they come in, the duration of those settlement services. Because when you have meaningful employment, of course, it gives you a greater scope as to your, your culture and, and, and the language and to be able to really participate more fully in Australia. So, look, I think there are... There are a lot of issues around this, this, this problem. Yeah, but I think it's fundamentally different to when my parents arrived and probably, Gemma, when your parents arrived. Uh, Victorian government says, you know, translated the virus warning into 53 languages, advertising 22 of them, the message still didn't get through to some communities. I wonder, when our parents arrived here, um, it wasn't like now where you could settle into a, a suburb uh, with, where 60 per cent of the people were born overseas, many would speak your language in an enclave. You couldn't, when my parents came here, get a satellite dish that brought you your news from the home country in your language. You really had to speak English or you'd drown. And now, of course, you get all these translated services. The emphasis is not on having to learn English if you're in a poor migrant enclave in this country. And I think that's really inhibiting the connections that we need. I, I believe that if you come to Australia and English is the mother tongue of this country, then there should be an imperative to learn that language. Um, not for any other reason except for you know, I integration. And integration doesn't mean uh, dispensing with the person's culture of origin. I mean, I'm living proof of that. I was born here. My father came to Australia mm. when he was 10 after three months on a boat. He spent three months living, uh, learning English and misbehaving, according to my grandmother. But my point is that I speak fluent Italian. I really enjoy going to my local neighbourhood cafe, which is run by Italians. But I've, we've held on to our culture, but we are proud Australians of Italian heritage. And I think if you, like to Fiona's point about the mix of issues around settlement services, but also the imperative for people, the expectation that if you come to, uh, to a wonderful life in Australia, and it is a wonderful life here, there is an expectation that there is a commitment to learn the language because it does open up a world of opportunities. It does, uh, again, particularly for women, uh, it does open up a, a whole new horizon of life here. And the yeah. last thing, you know, we, we want to share cultures. We don't no, want... No, I know. To Look, we can talk about on, the obligation to speak English. You're not going to get uh, any argument. I'm just saying human weakness... Easier to settle in an enclave. You don't move out. Every, the butcher, know. the candlestick I mean, maker, they all speak your, your home language I, and I, you, your news is from... This is the thing. But I listen, think it's I just, intent, we... though, Andrew. I think it's intent of the people who come. Like my, I, Again, all I have a point of reference is my grandparents and yeah. they wanted to learn to speak English. Well, you had to. That's the other thing. Uh, Fiona, uh, New South Wales, I mean, what... Gee, you guys are enjoying our distress <laughs> in Victoria. <laughs> Um, you guys are banning Victorians from going to any events, any sporting events and all that in, in New South Wales. Here's the Premier. I'm sorry, no Victorians will be able to purchase tickets or go to any major events in New South Wales. We've actually spoken to all the sporting codes that are having major events in the near future and all of them have been amazing. All the codes we've spoken to have been absolutely brilliant. They've told us they can manage their systems to prevent any Victorians purchasing tickets. OK, Fiona, so Victorians are now the lepers of Australia. No Victorians <laughs> need apply. Uh, how stupid does Victoria look from across the border? Well, you know, it is the socialist utopia of Victoria, David. Uh, Utopia's Andrew. not quite the word anymore. <laughs> Mm. Probably madhouse, not I'll go for Madhouse. So, so we, we, we can't allow those ideas to pollute us up here in, in New South Wales, where the weather's just a little bit warmer, not as warm as it could be, but, you know, we, we can't have these, these you know, disease-infested Victorians come up here to New South Wales. But look, at the end of the day, Andrew, here, there's a big, big issue here. I mean, 
that the behaviour of all of the states, and, and look, my state included in regard to this issue, there's, yes, there's a spike in Victoria. It's been, what, 20 cases over the last 24 hours. It's not great, but it's not the end of the world. And we do no. have some pretty good contract tracing in this country as well, and, and the resources and the support that's being put in there. I personally don't believe that any of the states should be closing boundaries like that. It's completely against what our federation is. And at the end of the day, in the words of Henry Parks, we are one nation, one people, one destiny, you know? And so, so why are we then having this stupid era where we've got all of these state premiers thinking that we are all these separate little, you know, and I'm know. sorry to, to the Black Lives Matter thing, separate well, little no colonies. Of you to it's quote, ridiculous. To quote an old white colonialist, but thank you very much for doing so. Uh, Gemma, <laughs> before we go, I need to ask you about this. Like the cancel culture, right? We've seen so many statues being pulled down all over the shop. The other day, some Americans pulled down even a guy that fought to end slavery, for heaven's sake. Now a former Swedish mayor says Sweden should also pull down a statue to Charles XII, the teenage king who actually saved Sweden from invasion. He's apparently a warmonger, even though uh, pigeons clearly uh, like him. Um, and Sweden should put up instead a statue to another teenager, global warming saint Greta Thunberg. Now, does this make sense to you in this Black Lives Matter hysteria when Thunberg's plans to fix global warming make a lot of black people a lot poorer? I think he needs to get off the gear, Andrew. I think he's <laughs> had too, too, many, too many long Nordic winters has affected his serotonin levels and he's not uh -huh. thinking right. I mean, it's just... It is time, I, I don't mean to be that person, but really it is time for those of us who like to occupy the centre lane and, and uh, we're, we're usually more polite, but it's time to be a little bit more forthright and call this BS for what it is. I mean, it is, it is, it's just silliness. It's silliness. And the only reason it's gotten to this point is for too long we've sort of looked the other way and thought it's idiocy and it'll burn itself out. So it's time to push back a little. That's my view. <laughs> Well, uh, I can't help but agree with you. Jim and Fiona Scott, thank you both <laughs> so much for your time. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure.